Good day and welcome to the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families Family Focused Strategies for Addressing Opioid Addiction and Recovery webinar. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Jackie Rhodes. Please go ahead. Thank you and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families webinar, Family Focused Strategies for Addressing Opioid Addiction and Recovery. My name is Jackie Rhodes and I will be helping with the logistics for the webinar today along with my colleague Kate Dumanian and the Resource Center Director Robin Senezal who will be moderating. Before we get to the content for today's webinar, we are going to go through a few logistical items. The webinar today will be an hour and a half, ending at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The webinar will be recorded, and the slides, transcript, and recording will be posted on our website in the coming weeks. Audio for the webinar will be broadcast through your computer. Please make sure your speakers and volume are turned on and up. If you have any technical issues, problems seeing something or hearing something, you can send us a message in the Q&A box on your screen or call us at 1-866-916. 4672 and we'll be sure to assist you. <clears throat> After the presentations today, we will have an online Q&A session. We encourage you to type in the questions you think of at any time while presenters are presenting by typing them in the Q&A pod located at the bottom right corner of your screen and clicking enter. We will collect submitted questions and then address those during the Q&A session at the end as time permits. If your question is for a specific presenter, please reference that when typing, when typing it in if possible. Throughout the webinar, presenters may reference materials or links relevant to their presentations. You can browse web links by clicking on any of the links in the web links pod at the top right-hand corner of your screen. And you can download materials by selecting the downloadable resources pod um, on the, right, the middle right side of your screen. We are excited about the agenda for today's webinar. Um, we're going to start um, with some introductions of our speakers. Um, next, I'm going to turn over the webinar to our project director, who will provide a welcome and overview of the Resource Center. Then we will talk a little bit about the opioid epidemic in general um, by setting the stage of the scope of the problem and then strategies for communicating to stakeholders. After that, we'll hear more about a family-centered approach to, to substance use treatment, and then we will have a program example, the Shatterproof Family Program, and we'll have someone from that program present for you and share more about their model. And we will end the day with discussion and Q&A. Following the presentations, as I mentioned, we'll have an online Q&A session. When we close, a brief feedback survey will pop up on your screen. We encourage you to complete the survey to provide us with valuable feedback for improving future webinars. Once you complete the survey, you'll be able to download a certificate of completion for attending today's webinar. So before we begin, I just want to briefly introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Robin Senezal is the director, is a director of Family Strengthening with ICF and the project director for the Resource Center. Robin will be sharing more with you about the Resource Center and will moderate the session today. Christina Zerla is a partner at ICF and a public health communications expert. She has nearly 20 years of experience leading large, complex public health communications campaigns that help federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, and private sector entities address some of our nation's most critical public health issues. She currently manages ICF's opioid communications portfolio with clients including the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Teresa Lemus is the Director of Family Treatment Court Training and Technical Assistance Program at Children and Family Futures. Ms. Lemus is responsible for overseeing the Family Treatment Court portfolio that includes the U.S. Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention's National Family Drug Court Training and Technical Assistance Program and the Prevention and Family Recovery Initiative. She's a nationally recognized expert in collaborative practice to improve outcomes for children and families affected by substance use disorders, family treatment court models, and clinical treatment. She's also a registered nurse, licensed alcohol and drug counselor, and a certified clinical supervisor. And then last but not least is Anne DeSantis-Lopez. She is the director of family programs at Shatterproof. 
Her personal and professional mission is to empower families and individuals living with addiction and a mental health diagnosis through education and support while connecting them to essential resources and skills that aid in recovery and healing. Before coming to Shatterproof, Ms. Lopez was a key leader in developing and launching a statewide program of psychosocial um, educational family workshops in New Jersey. The program was built on an evidence-based framework to educate loved ones of someone living with a substance use disorder. To learn more about our presenters, I encourage you to download the speaker information document in the downloadable resources pod on the right-hand corner of your screen. This document includes more detailed biographies as well as links to each speaker's website. And now that we know a little bit more about our speakers, we wanted to do a quick poll to learn more about you all in the audience and get a better perspective of who is listening today. So if you could just take a minute to check off uh, which stakeholder groups you're affiliated with related to um, the opioid epidemic, that would be wonderful. Excellent. So it looks like we have a big mix, um, and the largest stakeholder group is child welfare, followed by education, and then we've got a lot from public health and substance use treatment or prevention as well, and the general community. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, for participating. And now, Robin, I'll turn it over to you to get us started with opening remarks. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you very much. And Welcome, everyone. We appreciate you taking time out to join us today to talk about this very important topic. And I do hope that our focus on families as it relates to this topic is kind of a new perspective. We've heard a lot about the opioid epidemic, but we think it's also important to be focused on the families that are affected. As I noticed in the poll, a number of you are also personally affected. So thanks for joining us. So just a brief overview of the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families for those who are not familiar. Our focus is on the integration of healthy marriage and relationship education skills as part of a holistic approach to strengthening families. And so when we say healthy marriage and relationship education skills, I want to focus on four core skill areas. Interpersonal skills, such as communication and conflict resolution, along with critical skills like parenting and financial education. Uh, Parenting and finances are the top two stressors that impact all families, um, but they can be even more stressful for low-resource families. And these skills can be integrated into existing programs. So I hope that you are thinking along those lines as you listen to some of the rest of today's presentation. As Jackie mentioned, you can visit the web links that are in the box in the center of your screen. Um, but also, just to give you a little heads up in terms of the Resource Center, what you'll find if you visit our website, we have a media gallery with videos. We have a webinars. All of our webinars, including this one, are archived there along with our newsletters. We have a calendar of events that highlight events that are happening around the country that are focused on healthy relationship education and families. If you um, have an event that should be included in our library, please let us, I mean in our uh, calendar, please let us know. Um, as well as our library. Our resource library is very robust, over 3,000 research-based resources. But perhaps if you look for something in there, you may be aware of a resource we need to add. And in that case, let us know. We'd love to add it. We also have a virtual training center with seven different courses that can be completed for free. And if you complete the course and pass the quiz with an 80% rating, you can uh, get a certificate, which can also be used for CEU. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. We have a monthly newsletter. If you're not already on our list, sir, be sure to get on. And we're also on LinkedIn, so please connect with us on LinkedIn and Twitter. If you are a tweeter, please connect with us on Twitter as well. We develop a lot of resources. We've produced over 90 plus resources to address what we believed were some gaps, particularly as it relates to being stakeholder specific and culturally responsive. So we have toolkits, as you see here, uh, referenced our American Indian and Alaska Native, our Latino and our African American toolkits. Our latest toolkit focuses on Asian American families, but we also have resources for working with Muslim families, Orthodox Jewish families, same-sex families, and, and the list goes on. Uh, we have fact sheets, which are simple fact sheets that are easy to read, easy to digest, 
research to practice briefs, tip sheets, and guides. So again, I hope you'll take advantage of these resources. And a few of these resources are highlighted in your downloadable section, but I hope you'll visit our website and take advantage. One of the things that we did this past year, we highlighted healthy dating leads to healthy marriage based on a bunch of research that indicates that this um, millennial generation doesn't date, that there's a lot of hooking up versus dating. And so we developed a special collection that focused on that. If you visit the website, you'll see it's all organized, um, including issues like dating violence and teens and so forth. But we also partnered with Family Bridges to create a, a video series which was pushed out through Instagram, Dating IRL. So if you're young enough to know what IRL is in real life, I hope you will check out that information on Instagram. And so before I turn you over to Christina, Teresa, and Anne, I just wanted to mention I will be coming back to you after their presentations to help facilitate questions. So as we go through the presentation, so you don't forget your questions, please type them in in the Q&A box, and then we'll come back and revisit them. Again, thank you all for joining us, and I know you're going to enjoy this presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Christina. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning for some folks, if you're all the way on the, on the West Coast or uh, not here in the, in the afternoon where we are in the D.C. area. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. I've got about 15 minutes. And in my time, um, I, I want us to, to sort of talk about a, a couple key things. Um, as Robin said, feel free to type in questions within that Q&A box throughout this piece. I'll try and keep my eye down there in case there's something that's just kind of not, not really coming through that I'm saying that requires a, a bit of clarification. But in the time that I have, I really want to talk a little bit about the state of the opioid epidemic, kind of where we've been, where we are now, how we got here. But really more importantly, how the words that we use and the way that we communicate, not just about this epidemic, but in general, uh, really makes a difference in people's ability to kind of click in and connect with us. My background is in public health communications and in behavior change and social marketing. I could do, you know, 90 minutes myself on sort of the ins and outs of strategic communications. For the sake of time, I want to hit on a, a couple key things that I, uh, and some key tenets that I think can help guide this sort of the collective work that we do moving forward um, in the context of the opioid epidemic, but also sort of more broadly as we think about how we communicate with individuals. So first and foremost, um, you know, there is no shortage of news stories and articles and information out there about opioids. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes it's just kind of overload, right? And if you don't live and breathe this stuff every day, um, like many of us at, at ICF do, it can either be confusing or in the information can be kind of contradictory. So I want to take just a minute and, and really just get very, very basic, right? Like what do we mean when we say opioids? And there are different types of opioids. This specific, uh, this information has come from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm not going to get into kind of the nitty gritty, but I want to share these terms just as we think about kind of how people are reporting about and talking about opioids kind of in, in the general public to sort of get us all on the same page and create a foundation. So prescription opioids, these are medications that are prescribed um, by healthcare providers and they are used to treat mild uh, or moderate to severe uh, pain. Heroin, on the other hand, is an illicit, which is an illegal substance that is synthesized from morphine that essentially is kind of what, what we consider like the, 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 the street drug, right? Synthetic opioids can mean lots of different things. In many respects, prescription opioids can be synthetic or semi-synthetic. Uh, but in the context of, of kind of the news coverage and the information out there about synthetic opioids, really when people talk about synthetic opioids, um, they're talking about fentanyl. And fentanyl, again, is a synthetic, which means it's kind of created in a lab. And it is 100 times stronger than heroin. It is not illegal because it is oftentimes used in palliative and end-of-life care or for severe, severe pain management. But what we're encountering in the kind of out there in the world is what we call illicitly manufactured fentanyl, which is basically not 
the stuff that's on the up and up, that's administered by doctors, that's prescribed by healthcare professionals, that's given to people in hospitals, but rather the, the, the drugs and the substances that are within our current drug supply and that are coming from abroad um, and, and tainting many of, many of the street drugs around opioids that we're encountering. And finally, methadone is also a synthetic opioid, but methadone is used to refer to a medication as the name of a medication that helps people reduce or quit their use of heroin or other, or other opiates or opioids. So how did we get here? Um, you know, this has not, a, a crisis doesn't happen overnight, right? So let's look at the rise in opioid overdose deaths in America. In the 90s, we really experienced a boom and, an, and, a, and a surge in the number of prescriptions, prescription opioids that were being both written and that were kind of out in the world. What resulted, you know, 10, 20 years later, is really this uptick in the rise of heroin overdose deaths. And what followed that, which is where we sort of are today, is a rise in synthetic opioid overdose deaths from fentanyl. So what does this kind of look like when we, when we chart it over time? So this chart is overdose death rates involving opioids by type from 2000 to 2017. So about a 17 year time, time uh, frame. And you can see this green line at the top. Any opioid, death rates are rising. If we look at the purple and yellow lines of prescription opioids and heroin, over the past couple years, with the uh, release of CDC's prescribing guidelines, with more funding and support and resources on this issue, with boots on the ground to really stem the tide of the opioid epidemic, we are starting to see rates of opioid overdose deaths involving prescriptions and heroin really leveling off. But what is still really skyrocketing, and, and what I believe and what many believe is really the crux of the issue today, is the deaths it, resulting from overdoses of synthetic opioids like fentanyl. So how is this happening, right? We started in the 90s. We had a lot of prescription opioids out on the street. Providers got smart. Public health caught up. Communications campaigns got out there. We were able to reduce the number of prescriptions. But in that time, we saw people who became um, who developed opioid use disorders, prescription opioid use disorders, from their prescriptions, from their legit medications that they received from their doctors. And as their ability to, to obtain prescriptions, prescription opioids decreased, many transitioned to heroin, either because it was easier to get or because they preferred it or because um, the, it was more readily accessible. And now what we're seeing with, the, with synthetic opioids is the typical street drugs that you're, kind of, you're, you're getting now related to opioids, whether it's and a prescription that you think is legit that you're buying from someone, right, buying a, a pill of Percocet or buying a bag of heroin, they are tainted with fentanyl, illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And because fentanyl is 100 times stronger than heroin, individuals who think they're taking one pill of Percocet or whatever their regular dose is of, of heroin don't realize that their supply is tainted, and so they're overdosing because they're taking, in reality, much, much more. So let's look at the numbers. Um, let's sort of dissect this epidemic by the numbers a little bit more and look at the demographics associated with this. So we know that you know, while prescription opioids, is, it's, get, it's getting better, right? There is more awareness. There are fewer prescriptions, um, generally speaking, out there on the street. Providers in, in most all fields um, at least have a better sense and understanding that sort of this is an issue, there's more education happening, but they're still involved, prescription opioids are still involved in about a third of all opioid overdose deaths. At the same time, half a million people in 2017 reported, use, reported using heroin in the past year. And what's really interesting about the opioid epidemic, and I think what, what is sort of helping to, to cement it as a real crisis, is that it is beginning to impact demographics um, all across the board. With heroin as one example, we are seeing heroin use increase among demographics that have historically low rates of misuse and use, like women, those that are privately insured, and individuals with higher incomes. When prescription opioids first kind of came out on, on the scene, um, the issue remained with middle-aged white guys. But over time, as the epidemic has evolved, 
as individuals have transitioned, um, as the response has, has, has sort of um, come and, and uh, really been addressed at the community and state level, we're really seeing everybody uh, across many different demographics um, impacted by this. And it's important to note that past misuse of prescription opioids is really the highest risk factor in current heroin use. So there are individuals that, you know, certainly started with heroin and they didn't transition from prescription opioids to heroin to illicit opioids, but um, the data really point to, the, to, to this sort of, this path to opioid use that begins with prescription opioids. Synthetics, as we saw in the prior slide, uh, really have been, been involved in more deaths than for any other type of opioid. So that really remains um, a, a big issue that I know um, perhaps many on this call, many federal health agencies that we work with, many communities are really working, working hard to address. So I am a communications person by trade. I am not a numbers person. This is the last graph that I will, the last chart, the last math and data that I will show you. But I do think this is a really important point and, and one I want to mention, especially because the topic of this webinar is about opioids. That being said, I do not want to discount that there are other substances out there that are impacting certain communities at far greater and higher rates. So we've got 18 million people aged 18 or older that have a substance use disorder, whether it's heroin or another opioid or something else entirely, or alcohol or polysubstance use, right? We have 18 million individuals that have a mental illness and about eight, eight and a half million people across the country that have both a substance use disorder and a mental illness or co-occurring mental illnesses. So I, I want to recognize the crisis that is at hand with opioids, but I do not want to discount broader substance use prevention, treatment, and recovery, and how very, very important it is in our work sort of collectively to look at opioids, yes, but really take this broader area of substance use prevention, treatment, and recovery, addressing individuals' mental health and, and, and mental illnesses, and, and really getting sort of really recognizing the important role that the work many of us on, the, on this call do outside of the opioid epidemic. And th that's why I think, you know, when we think about communicating about this topic, that's why the words that we say and the way that we talk to people about this is so important. The stakes are pretty high, and the work that you do is critical, whether you're dealing with individuals, uh, with families, with young people, with old people, regardless of demographics. This topic is really important. And in many respects, our job collectively is to inform people about available services, programs, issues, uh, and to persuade them to take some kind of action. And that's really the definition of communications. As a communications professional, what I study, what I do every day, what people pay me to do for a living, that is in essence the definition of communications. It's to inform people about something or persuade them to do something different than they're already doing or to continue doing something that that uh, a habit or a behavior that they're already doing. And so much of our work really can, can hinge around how we communicate to the world not only the services and the programs and the opportunities that are available to individuals in our community by sort of working with us or coming to us for something, but really in telling the world your story as an entity, as an organization, and reinforcing this idea that the work that you do really, really matters. And beyond that, as we had seen a moment ago, the, if we consider the importance of substance use prevention and treatment and recovery and, and, and how many individuals are suffering in, in our community, we really can take the way that we communicate and help normalize substance use disorders. We can position them as a disease versus a moral failing. And in the language that we use, in the way that we speak, we can help reduce stigma. And it really does start with our words. What I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about kind of how, what are some kind of tips and do's and don'ts when it comes to talking about this issue. For individuals who live and breathe this stuff every day, this might be a good refresher. For those who may not be as entrenched in sort of the, the, the public health field, this could be a good sort of in, intro and overview to the way that the field 
really considers you know, what the field considers best practice in terms of how we message to individuals and the words and the phrases that we use. So not too long ago, the Office of National Drug Control Policy released a paper called Changing the Language of Addiction. And what, they, what essentially the, the key message here is that in order to help reduce stigma and make that transition so that individuals can begin to see this truly as a disease and not something that's just wrong with an individual, right? we should use something called people-first language, which puts the individual and his or her situation above the issue that he or she is facing. So as we think about how to sort of characterize and talk about some of our work, instead of saying things like addict or drug abuser, which puts the blame on the individual, the ONDCP and federal health agencies really recommend that we say substance use disorder or an opioid use disorder. Same deal with thinking about kind of is someone clean, are they dirty, are they on the wagon, are they off the wagon, right? Characterizing somebody in that situation as a person in recovery or a person in treatment or saying they have a positive or negative toxicology screen really humanizes the issue, humanizes the, the topic and helps and, and can help fight stigma. And finally, another example that ONDCP gives that I think is valuable for the work that many of us do on this call and on this webinar is using the phrasing medically assisted treatment instead of, you know, drug replacement or substance substitution, right? The idea here is that we are not replacing one bad habit with another. We are not replacing one, um, one issue with something else, but what, rather we are using medication to assist in the addressing and, and the, the treatment of something that is a legitimate disease, much in the way we would if we had, um, if, if we were treating high blood pressure or heart disease or diabetes. So moving on, I pulled together just a bit of a cheat sheet. I know these slides are going to be available after the fact, um, but this, I found this to be a helpful resource. Uh, even in, in the work that I do is, as, as we sort of write and think about how to communicate with individuals. I've shared on the left here some words to avoid and on the right um, some suggestions for other phrasing and terminology to use. Again, so that we're putting people first, helping to reduce stigma, we're sort of staying up to date and, and abreast of where the field is going in terms of how they're characterizing um, many of these issues and, and the words and the phrases that they're using. So typically when we talk about opioids, we don't like to refer to them as painkillers. Um, we instead would like individuals to say prescription opioids or prescription opioid pain medications, and that's really because the, the term painkiller is not only charged, but it may not be all that accurate. I think there is debate about the efficacy of prescription opioids in the management of long-term chronic pain, and so it's a, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a misnomer. It's a it's a bit inaccurate to say that it is in fact a painkiller. Going down, drug addiction, drug habit. Here too, we want to refer it to the individual. So it's an individual with a substance use disorder or an opioid use disorder, not somebody that has a drug addiction or a drug habit. I think abuse is another term that I have seen in my you know, 20 years working um, across federal health agencies and with states and grantees um, that ha has really just ha has really sort of dissipated. We, we're, we don't talk so much about abuse anymore, um, again, because it indicates sort of a, an elective choice by an individual to do something negative. Rather, we say that we, you know, that there's a person with a substance use disorder or people who use drugs instead of addicts or junkies or perpetrators or crim criminals. Again, where we want to put the individual sort of be before the issue that he or she is dealing with. And then finally, this is a bit of a nuance that may or may not touch the work that you do. Um, but I wanted to mention it because the field is moving away from the phrasing recreational use, and instead we are going towards the phrase non-medical use. And the idea here is that sort of recreational sort of implies, um, it implies certain things, and non-medical is simply a, a bit more accurate, it's, um, especially when it comes to prescription opioids, because prescription opioids do have a medical value when they are used, when they are misused, not taken as they're prescribed, either taken too often um, or taking, taking too many, not, not following how they're prescribed, they're being used um, non-medically. So a couple other things um, I want to mention before I close with a, with a bit of an activity and, and kind of download a bit of comms 101. Um, so there is an opportunity, as I mentioned before, for the work that we do to help reduce stigma. 
when we think about communicating to individuals, whether it's officially or unofficially, we know that scare tactics don't work. We have about a decade of research now from not only public health communications campaigns, but, but other efforts that trying to scare someone straight doesn't actually do anything in the end. Instead, and I've been doing research with individuals across you know, myriad demographics for, for, for two decades, um, and regardless of age, this is true, and that is that individuals really want to see the human side of a topic or issue, where we show the people and what they're struggling with and not necessarily the problem itself first and foremost. When we think about how to communicate the phrasing, the pictures we use, the images that we put online and on social media, research has shown that we should really avoid imagery of paraphernalia because not only can it be triggering, but it also, back to the second bullet here, doesn't really humanize the issue. So seeing somebody lying on the ground with a bottle of pills spilled or a spoon or a needle only further reinforces a misconception that this is a moral failing or that there's something wrong with this individual. And for those who are in active recovery or, or, or in recovery or even in treatment, that, that imagery could be triggering, um, whether it reminds them of, uh, of an earlier time or it makes them feel sort of negative about themselves. Rather, our tone should really be empathetic and supportive and informative. In a lot of the focus group research that we've done, we've heard individuals tell us things like, we, want us, we, we, we know this is an issue, right? We, we want to understand that this is an issue, but we also want to feel somewhat hopeful about this. And, and I imagine many on this call, in the work that you do day to day with individuals sort of talking about substance use issues, this sort of ring, rings true to you as, as well, right? And something else that we found in terms of communications best practices is um, thinking about a call to action or resources. Where can people go for more information? Whether it's, um, and, and I, I say this is mostly for, you know, when you communicate sort of verbally or visually on social media, you know, online, if you're printing out flyers or brochures, right? Make sure that there's a call to action for individuals where they can go and get more information. I think oftentimes in communications campaigns we, you know, raise a level of awareness, but sometimes we fail to sort of tell the individual, tell the audience what it is that we want them to do. Go to this website, get more information, get resources, check this site out, learn more here. So if it was just as easy as figuring out kind of the right words to say and then getting those words out into the world, then how come people are not banging our doors down and throwing money at us? right, and, and all that we do. Why aren't they saying, your work is fantastic here, here's a billion dollars, right? Um, and I would say that, that from where I sit, that issue is a communications issue. And that issue is because oftentimes, there's something called the curse of knowledge. Because everybody on this call, myself included, is an expert at something. And many times when we communicate to individuals, we use something called the expert approach, which is that we say to ourselves, we know what's best, we're going to talk to you, we're going we're gonna to give you all the information, the stuff that we think you need to know, and we expect you to do something with that that, that that we approve of. I'd like to take just a minute to do a brief example and a brief activity to sort of communicate this fact. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with my hands. Uh, I hope you can all hear it, and then I'll come back and... and um, and when I'm finished, I'd like folks to type in the Q&A box what you think I did. So get ready to listen. If you're multitasking, close that other window and listen up. <laughs> All right, here we go. Does anyone have an idea about what I just did? Type, type, type away. Did I do some Morse code? Did I um, do SOS? Did I clap something in particular? No one knows, right? You guys didn't realize? You didn't hear what I just did? You didn't hear 
the sound and the song of Take Me Out to the Ball Game when I was clapping like that. Take me out to the ball game. I'm a big baseball fan, and opening day starts pretty soon. Baseball season starts up again. You didn't hear that? You couldn't smell the popcorn and hear the, the team out on the field and listen to the song and hear the band and the music and the people laughing and the people singing? No, of course you couldn't do that. Of course you couldn't understand any of that. And why? It's because me as the expert, I just basically clapped at you for 15 seconds, something that to you was absolute nonsense. To me it made sense. I was the expert of that song. You were not the expert. You were the audience. And when we think about who we're trying to reach, oftentimes we need to say to ourselves, and, and oftentimes we make the mistake of communicating to people using words or phrases or language or approaches or methods that they can't even understand. You're on a webinar. That's a terrible way for me to communicate a song to you. I didn't even tell you what that song was about. I don't even know if all of you like baseball. But oftentimes we make assumptions about the people that we're trying to reach, and we don't put ourselves in their shoes. So I want to leave you with uh, this sort of key tenets of effective communications, given all that we've talked about, the opioid epidemic, using people first language, how to manage stigma. And that is that instead of thinking about things in the context of how we as experts expect individuals to respond to the things that we say, I would propose that we think of an audience-centric approach, where instead of blaming our audience, for not understanding what we're trying to accomplish and not doing the things that we want them to do, we instead look internally, both within ourselves and within our organizations, to consider what is wrong with our offering. What's wrong with the way that we're delivering our message? Can our audience even hear us? You could hear my clapping, but did you really, really hear it? You probably didn't. You were really confused. Maybe I gave you a headache. And then more importantly, is this really the best way to reach those individuals? And so as we think about sort of how to communicate to individuals out in the world, um, these are some of the key tenets that, you know, as a comms expert, we sort of apply and, and I, I apply every day. As I mentioned before, there's a, a whole field here. If there are more specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but in the time allotted, I wanted to give folks a, a little bit of a sense of sort of what it takes to communicate and some tips about some of the language that we use and how that can impact um, the way that individuals receive our messages. So with that, I am going to pass it to Teresa. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Lemus, and I am with Children and Family Futures. We operate the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. Um, so that should sort of tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a family-focused strategy for addressing um, not just the opioid epidemic, but also just substance use disorder in general. Um, when it impacts parents, when it impacts individuals who are responsible for children, um, particularly young children, um, family treatment courts, are a, are a very effective strategy for um, improving the overall health and well-being for families. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. The mission at Children and Family Futures, um, you can see it here, is to improve safety, permanency, and well-being and recovery outcomes for parents and families that are impacted by trauma, substance use, and mental health disorders. And we certainly know that with substance use disorder, including the opioid use uh, disorder, uh, many, many times when we are working with these families, there is a lot of trauma that um, exists in, in, and maybe have been passed down for generations. It may just continues to recur in, over generations. And there may be mental health disorder as well. So as, as Christina referred to earlier, the problem is much bigger than the opioid epidemic. Um, but this gives us an opportunity to really talk to folks about you know, ways to address substance use disorder in general. I want to just um, highlight uh, some data um, as it relates to um, children who, who are taken out of their homes because of parental substance use disorder. So um, this first graph really shows you, and I'm going to, I'm going to sort of uh, point to the, the yellow line here. In 2012, we were really at our lowest census for the number of children in the United States that were that had to be removed from home because it was no longer safe to be there. 
So for those of you who uh, aren't, aren't familiar with the child welfare system, usually what will happen is a, a call will come into a hotline um, in that state or that county. Um, child welfare is, um, has to go out, usually um, it's the child protective worker, they go out to see if, if there is in fact a problem and, and unfortunately when, when there is substance use disorder many, many times um, there is also other safety factors and so children have to be removed. Not all the time, but a lot of times. And what you see here is that that trend line is starting to go up again. And um, in the next slide that I'll show you, it's a little bit more dramatic um, and, a, and a little bit more um, of a concern because when we look at the data, and a lot of it does correlate to the opioid problem, um, but again, other substances are definitely um, a factor. You see that for all the children who were removed from their home, um, the biggest increase is in, is in um, children under the age of one. So that, that number for children under the age of one is, is going up. And that's a big concern because you know if, if you're a parent that the time in that first, you know, first three years in particular, um, bonding and attachment are critical. Um, there are so many things that are critical in, in, those, in that first year that if a child has to be removed from their parent, um, it, it is definitely going to cause trauma um, and also other, other things that are going to show up over the, the lifetime for that child. So it's a big concern that we're seeing that. Um, many states, um, well, all states report on the number of um, removals, child removals that happen because of substance use disorder. It's not counted very well, but what I can tell you is that that number two is going up. So, so basically what we're seeing is that when child welfare goes out to, to investigate a concern, um, we're seeing the numbers go up in terms of substance use being the primary factor for, um, for that child having to be removed from the home. And I, I want to point out, I think it's very important that substance use in and of itself doesn't cause a removal. Um, what happens a lot of times is that because of the substance use, um, because that, that person who um, has been using substances um, has, is now paying all of their attention to obtaining the substance, they're under the influence, and their brain is dependent on that substance, you know, they're no longer doing the things that we would see as being so quote unquote normal, um, like taking care of their child, buying food, things like that. So a lot of times the safety issue is really around um, other things and not, not, not directly the, the drug itself. So I think that's really important. What we know about children who come into the child welfare system, particularly because of substance use disorder, um, they have a lower likelihood of successful reunification than other families. So if, if a child's removed for other reasons, substance use is, is not a factor, um, that, that child, those children are more likely to go home than ones where substance use disorder is a factor. And a lot of that is because we just don't have um, we haven't found the best resources um, for the number of people in this situation. Um, and so that, that's a big issue. And, and I think also we've had a, a misunderstanding about substance use disorder for a very long time. Again, going back to Christina's point about stigma. We also know that children who um, are in homes where substance use disorder is a factor is that they have things, um, they have difficulty in school, they have school delays, maybe they're um, truant in school, they're not going to school, they don't have immunizations, and they tend to stay in foster care longer than other children. Substance use disorder um, impacts the entire family. It impacts the immediate family, the extended family. It might even impact the neighbors. I mean, it impacts everyone. Um, but what we know is that the impact on child development is, um, is particularly concerning um, for the, some of the reasons I just talked about. We also know that it's, it's very, very often um, combined with, with added trauma. And certainly, any time a child has to be removed from his or her parent, regardless 
of the situation and, and what the situation was in that home, it's extremely traumatizing. So we also know, and we're getting better and better at this, that substance use treatment um, has to be done in a family-centered way for it to be effective. Um, and when it's not, you're gonna, you can have very severe disruption um, for that family. If the family is disrupted because of substance use disorder, then treating it needs to also be family focused. So, you know, I said I was going to talk about family treatment courts. Uh, family treatment courts are one of the best uh, ways that we have found to work with these families that have a moderate to severe substance use disorder, meaning that their brain is dependent, um, addicted to that substance. And when that happens, again, that parent, that part of the brain is going to dictate what that parent pays attention to, what that parent does. And unless that's disrupted, um, that child is going to fall second to, to the, the uh, force that's driving that brain. So family treatment courts understand that. Um, we know that when, um, when the brain is dependent on a substance, that it's it's very serious and there needs to be a collaborative approach to serving this family. First of all, there needs to be um, an awareness of how serious the substance use disorder is, what kind of safety and, and um, other, other challenges um, are, are impacting that family. It could be poverty, it could be homelessness, usually it's all of the above. It could be mental health, but to understand that and then to work together um, so that we can have better outcomes for these families. So um, I'm not going to read this whole slide. You guys have access to this, but this is just some of the research that talks about, um, again, the likelihood that um, these families do, do, um, don't do as well. Um, they don't reunify as often if, if we don't have a collaborative way to um, address the needs of these families. So Family Treatment Court takes um, really three main partners, um, although it's not just three partners. It's really the court, so it's usually the family or the juvenile court. Um, adding that to the child welfare services and the child welfare agency in that jurisdiction, in that town, city, and also treatment. And treatment is not just substance use disorder treatment, but it's um, parent-child therapy. It's, it's uh, developmental services for children, but, but taking those systems and um, coming together for the purpose of serving this family who is, um, who is in trouble and the child may have, have had to be removed from the home. We know that when these systems work together, uh, one of the things they do is um, the child welfare agency, the court, the treatment folks come together and they say, our goal is to do whatever it takes to help this family reunify if at all possible. Um, second to that is that this child needs permanency. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But we know that when these systems work together with that as the goal, um, you have increased recovery for parents. Um, many, many times these children can remain at home even though there may be substance use that, that is um, still happening or is, um, is decreasing because of treatment, that kids can stay home because there's other supports at home. If they have to be, um, if, if children have to remove, be removed from home, we know that family treatment court um, families reunify at a much faster rate. And when they reunify, it sticks, meaning that they don't come back into the system as often as families who don't go through family treatment court. So again, family treatment court focuses on the entire family. Because of the role that family treatment courts have played in serving families, um, you see that we've just had a steady increase. And actually, even um, today, this 495 is a count that's about three years old. And, and we think it's much closer to around 600 plus family treatment courts across the country. So the likelihood of any of you on this webinar today having heard of family treatment court, maybe have worked with a family treatment court, um, is, is pretty likely. And so um, it, it's a, it, we, we're very busy right now <laughs> trying to help family treatment courts sort of get started and understand how to do this work because it is very effective for these families. 
I'm not going to read this slide, but I wanted you to have it for reference. It's just basically a definition of family treatment court. But what I do want to pay attention to is what a family treatment court approach looks like and why this is important. There's been a lot of research done with family treatment courts and this collaborative model. And um, there's really seven key ingredients that you should see if you're working within or you're working with a family treatment court. And one is that we have a, a way to identify families where substance use disorder is, a, is an issue. Um, the, the faster you identify substance use disorder in, in a parent or in that family, the more likely um, you are to be able to keep that child home um, and, and or to have that family reunify um, um, as opposed to having the child languish in the foster care system. Another common ingredient of family treatment court is that access to treatment and other services is fast, lightning fast. Um, sometimes you'll hear that there's a waiting list for treatment and, um, and if you think about it in this context, if a child has to be um, removed from his or her parents and can't be with his or her parents because we can't figure out how to get that, that parent into treatment, that, that's, a, that's a huge concern. So family treatment courts ensure that that happens. We make sure that there's a, a host of services wrapped around this family to help that parent in their recovery. Um, and then there's also services that are attached to the family treatment court that help uh, heal some of those wounds that occur because of what um, happened in that family due to the substance use disorder. Um, judges are extremely important in the context of family treatment court, and it looks very different um, than maybe in a regular court, If for those of you who have been in court before, um, because in family treatment court, the judge is a part of the therapeutic treatment team. They're still a judge, and they still have their job to do, but, but the judicial oversight looks very different. Um, so probably the most important one that I want to hit on is that a family treatment court uses a collaborative approach that we no one agency can can um, solve the issues challenges um, for these families and um, time is of the essence so I won't spend a lot of time on this but it's important to know that whenever you have a family that has come to the attention of child welfare and substance use disorder is a factor in that case there's a clock that's ticking. It's called the Adoption Safe Families Act. And um, it's something you can look up if you're not aware of what it is, but it's very important because basically means that um, the parent, that family is on a clock, and it definitely means that the agencies involved, the child welfare system, the treatment system, the court system are on a clock as well. What matters here, um, I think a lot of times, um, uh, practitioners and others don't realize is how those clocks don't match up in, in the in the in the court system because of ASPA and, and the child welfare agencies are mandated to ensure that children have permanency so we basically if a child's removed because um, of parental substance use we have 12 months 12 months to, to help um, intervene, um, identify, get them into treatment, you know, work through all of these different issues. 12 months is not a long time when you consider going over to the right-hand side that treatment and recovery for substance use disorder um, is, for, first of all, it, it, it's one day at a time. It, it, it takes a lot of time for the, in, any individual to um, to withdraw, to stop using, reduce using, and then to address all of the behavior issues and uh, uh, psychosocial, mental health, other issues that have occurred because of the substance use disorder. So that's not a 12-month timetable. That's a forever timetable. Anybody who's in recovery would tell you that it, it, it takes a little bit every single day. And certainly when somebody's in early recovery, it's, um, it, it's in a very intensive process. And then you think about the fact that I told you earlier that the majority of kids that are being removed are under the age of one. I want you to think if you're a parent or you've ever been around a baby, um, how, what changes in a week? What changes in a month? So if a child's in out-of-home care and they aren't able to, to be nurtured and, and bond with his or her parents, 
um, you're losing a lot of time, and, and so you've got that child development clock. So family treatment courts take all these clocks into consideration, and we, we bust down every barrier that we can find to ensure that this family is being served and that those children can go home and to a safer, healthier home with, with parents who are in recovery and, and working on their recovery. Um, that's what family treatment courts do. Um, I already talked about the fact that no single agency can do this alone. Um, it takes a lot of collaboration in a family treatment court model um, to help um, these families, and um, it's, it's extremely rewarding. And, and the data around the effectiveness of the family treatment court model when it's being um, carried out with those seven ingredients, um, we have much better outcomes with these families than if they don't go into a family treatment court. So here's just a little bit of data around um, family-centered, the family-centered approach. And I'm just going to pick one to highlight, and that is that um, retention and completion of substance use treatment and recovery um, is the strongest, and it's one of the strongest predictors of reunification for parents with substance use disorder. And so I think that's very important, and I think, you know, you can read these. It, it's pretty compelling, and there's a lot of research that's been done around family treatment courts and the benefits. The, the one I want to pay attention, the other slide I want to pay attention to is this one, that when we focus only on the parent and not on the parent in, in the context of his or her relationships, um, including the relationship with their children, um, we, we miss a huge piece of who that person is. And so family treatment courts really focus on the relational aspect of substance use disorder and, um, and, and healing needs to occur within that same context for children and for parents. This piece here about guilt, it's the fourth, uh, third bullet, fourth bullet down, is a big one, that when you have a parent where children have had to be removed because of their substance use disorder, if we don't help them through therapy and other, other types of um, resources with that grief and that guilt, it can, can continue to fuel their substance use um, long term. So here's some costs of focusing on parent recovery only and not paying attention to what's happening with the children who have gone through this ordeal. Um, we know that these are generally our future clients because if, if we're not addressing that parent-child dyad, if we're not ensuring within um, our collaborative that children are, are getting the services they need in context of what's happened in their life, um, they will, um, they'll be our next customer, so to speak. Um, so we really pay attention to that. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about the fact that treatment needs to support the whole family. And when, when it does, it increases the recovery for parents um, who have substance use disorder. It can decrease the likelihood of substance use disorder in um, older children in the family. Um, we know that um, family treatment courts pay a lot of attention to helping parents um, either obtain or improve their parenting skills, and so doing that enhances child well-being and overall that whole family's well-being. So I, I would encourage you all, if you have a family treatment court in your community, um, to seek it out, to find out a little bit about it, and, um, and maybe ask some questions or be involved with it um, if you are in the position to refer families or um, be involved with families who might be in family treatment court. So that concludes my discussion. I am going to turn it over to Ann Lopez with Shatterproof. Thank you, Teresa, and good day, everyone. Um, at Shatterproof, um, our mission really is to help end the devastation the disease of addiction causes families, and we are doing that through advocacy and education. So our family program, which is under the umbrella of our entire organization, has a mission to educate, equip, and empower those families. We do know that one in three families are impacted by addiction. And chances are you know at least one of those people that has someone um, in their family struggling with the disease of addiction. 
we have come to learn that these families most likely have gaps. Many of them do, and there's others that we don't know about. They have gaps in the information um, in all the areas of dealing with addiction because we know that this disease um, has many components to it. And they don't always understand all the facets of the disease of addiction, how it affects the brain. Um, sometimes they don't necessarily know how to navigate the treatment um, and the options. So we, we really want to inform them of all the options that are available to them. And finally, they don't fully understand what recovery looks like. Sometimes people believe that treatment is recovery, and they're really two separate components. So we built this program on three pillars. It is a psychosocial educational program. Um, and I'm going to leave that slide up so you could take a look at it. But like uh, our other two speakers spoke about, these are on the slides. So the education program is for loved ones of someone with a substance use disorder. Our curriculum contains many relevant topics, and you'll see them in just a minute. Um, these topics and issues. Um, have been suggested by families that we met with across the country, and they have been reviewed by our scientific advisory board. These are the program uh, topic sessions, and there's a couple in there that you'll see our previous speaker kind of touched on, and one of them is the communication, overcoming stigma. So this. The content of this program is evidence-informed. It's been compiled by various evidence-based models, research, and resources. And like I said before, it is reviewed by our scientific advisory board. The whole purpose is that this equips loved ones with the skills, tools, and information and strategies that aid in understanding and navigating the disease of addiction. And like I said, their treatment options. But also what we added to it is understanding self-care, not only for their loved ones, but themselves. And we really focus on multiple pathways of recovery. And we understand and really nail down and hammer home for them that there's not only one way to do it. And our goal is to introduce them to all the different ways that they can introduce themselves, they can introduce someone else to all those options they have available to them, meaning that it doesn't always have to be just an abstinence-based uh, approach to recovery. It could be um, you know, harm reduction. It could be another alternative to it. Uh, we really focus on a lot of the p components of changing language, and Christina did share about that. One of the big pieces that we like about the program is not only that one builds on the other, but there is you know, this final piece of um, the ongoing support, talking about the resources, and we build up to that by introducing all these different areas to focus on. And one of them, and this is what a lot of people really do prefer, is that we go through the program with them and we build an action plan that is non-crisis focused or crisis focused, meaning that if someone is in active use and all of a sudden um, they decide, like, you know what, this isn't working for me anymore. I want to go to treatment. The family members build that action plan, and that's in the session eight um, uh, topic. Uh, they build that action plan with their loved ones that help them explore what the options could be so they're not making a decision while they're in crisis or they're not making a decision while they're vulnerable because we know that sometimes you're not thinking straight when that pressure is on. So they can look at it while in wellness, and it's a applicable for if they just want to go to treatment, if they need to go to detox. The crisis part of it is if they've overdosed. If they are in crisis, they end up in the emergency room, and the family members know exactly who they're going to call. Um, if they do nothing else in the action plan, like knowing what things cost, in-pocket, out-of-pocket, the insurance benefits, all of that stuff, at least they know who their first call is. And uh, Nine times out of ten, that first call may be that trusted person or they know the detox they want to send the person to. So we really help families understand uh, the research, help do the research, help them find how to advocate for themselves and others so that they can make the decisions that are the most appropriate for their family members. We do touch on the co-occurring piece because we know that the co-occurring uh, piece is recognized more widely than it has been in the past. And we know that there's a very high percentage of those that have a mental health diagnosis. We help them explore. Um, 
we talked about the language, we talked about them gaining the knowledge and skills. Because here, if we go back to we want to educate, we want to equip, and we want to empower. We know that when family members are equipped with new language tools, questions to ask, they feel more empowered to advocate for their loved ones. We do this through delivery um, in our program. This is community-based or organization-based delivery. And our facilitators and our participants do have access to all material. And the facilitators, they are trained and certified co-facilitators. And the recommendation is that the one facilitator is a peer, um, meaning someone with lived experience. It could be a family member. It could be a certified peer, uh, a recovery coach, and a clinician. They all, and including the participants, all have access to this portal. This portal connects the facilitators with the videos, the handouts that they need. Uh, they can look at evaluations by their participants. For the participants, they have their own login, and they can provide the feedback to the program while accessing all the handouts, the materials that they see in the videos that they see in the groups. They also if, uh, can have a participant journal. Now, this is for the participants that are attending the program. This is a hard copy, kind of a magazine type of a material. And it has everything that they do in the program in person. But what we've added to this, and the difference is what's online than this, is we actually have a place where the family members can begin self-care of setting intentions for the week, reflecting on how their week was, and journaling. Because we do know that the journaling really taps into that subconscious that allows sometimes the feelings and emotions, what they do, what's working, what's not, it comes to light as that, that pen is going to paper. So there's such a value in journaling. And we actually have a page in there that talks about the value of journaling for an individual. And they can look at their own growth and reflect on what they've learned and how they've changed as an individual. If you want to bring that program to your area on our website, which I'll show you in just a minute, um, it tells you how you what the content is. If you want to partner with an organization or if you're looking for funding to help you, bring the program to your community. All the details are here, and you can share it with other co-facilitators or potential co-facilitators, an organization, if you want to bring it to a recovery center. So everything is there for you. And going back into the portal, um, these templates are in that portal. So you have a lot of materials that are at your disposal here. But most times, a lot of people just share the uh, link with people that may be interested. So you can refer them right to that uh, link. We have launched. Um, our program in a lot of different communities um, throughout the state, so we just direct them to this often. We've been running facilitator trainings as well, and um, I'm going to just show you the content for, before I show you uh, the website and then our dates. So our facilitator training manual, our facilitators have access to this online, and really what it does is it provides whoever wants to deliver this program with everything that they need to deliver the program, including uh, how to talk, how to guide them through each session that they're delivering. Um, we do have each session scripted, should they want language to use, or we give them prompts and objectives and key points for that session. And let me just hit on this, introduce it, and then I will use my own words. But everything is built for a facilitator and what they need to deliver the program. As I said, including the videos, the handouts, how to start it, how to end it. Um, we also do our training um, in three parts. And it includes a first part of the training, with in which introduces any facilitator, whether it be peer or clinician, with uh, group dynamic skills. If I want to send this out to someone, we give you an email template. How do I promote it? You will get a template that has um, all marketing materials. So you have everything at your disposal. This is a boxed curriculum. So when someone is trained and when they pay for the program, they get all those materials. You do have a two-year certification. You have access to all the videos. 
So what this does, it really simplifies it for people that want to bring it to their community. They know their families need it, but they don't know where to begin. And also, the big part of all of this is that we want to encourage consistency in delivery of material so it doesn't matter where you are in our country, that you get um, this scientifically backed information, you get consistency that doesn't include a personal objective or opinion. So you're getting this very objective information delivered to you in a way that includes how do I deliver it. That process in delivery is just as important as the content because we know that many of these family members that walk into our programs, they have a lot going on. There's a lot of stress. There's trauma behind what they've experienced. So we need to give them some process that introduces them to their own wellness because many times we do know that family members, they put themselves second. They put themselves aside. They focus on their loved one that is dealing with substance use disorder. So for just that hour, hour and a half of time, whatever it is that a facilitator chooses to deliver it in, we want to give them the opportunity to just sit, be supported, and focus on themselves. And if they are told to do it on themselves, then a lot of times they don't. So we actually take them through the process and we actually model what they're seeing or how to do it. Our biggest piece of our training and really what I focus on with my facilitators is really how to learn how to listen and then speak directly from the heart. And when they do that, a lot of times it comes out very differently and they support their loved one very differently as well. Our website is shatterproof.org. And then our family program uh, website is here, so our page has everything that you need uh, to look for the materials and a lot of the pieces that I spoke about. Um, let me just mention our, here, let me show you the bottom part. And this is just the bottom part of our front page of our uh, family program. It's um, if you want to host a program is here. Um, if you are an organization or treatment facility that you want quite a few of your staff trained, you can actually host a training. So you would just click on the green button. Um, if you want to bring a program to your community, if you're a peer that a family member or somebody else with lived experience um, or a community member and you want to bring it to your community, you would click here and it would take you to the application page. Or if you're just looking to find a program, family members, or just see if there's a program already running in your area, you would click here. We are still in our pilot phase of the delivering the program or launching the program. So we don't have a lot of um, locations listed here just yet. But as we continue to add more locations, you can find them here. Now we do have a few locations that are launching. We have launched in two locations in New Jersey. One of them is not quite listed yet. We will be in um, Massachusetts and we will be on a virtual delivery. Um, that's a closed one just yet because we're running our test on that one. So our upcoming training locations, um, I didn't list them though, um, we have seven coming up from May until November, and they are listed once you go through the um, bring it to your community, you will see the trainings listed there. And really that's all I have for you, so I'm going to turn it back over because I'm done with my presentation. So thank you so much. I think Robin's going to take it back now. Thank you so Hi. much, Ann. Um, sorry, just real quick, as a reminder, you can ask a question by typing it in the Q&A pod located at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and um, we will get started in a few minutes with the Q&A session. Robin? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for that wonderful information, and I hope that our um, participants today enjoyed it as much as I did. I do have some questions in the queue, and so we're going to start with uh, you, Christina. Thank you for, first of all, thank you for helping us to think more strategically about communication. Uh, the question is, can you share some strategies or some resources for talking to kids about opioid addiction and substance abuse disorder, um, and also what age is appropriate uh, to, to start those conversations? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> Hello again, everyone. Um, so let's do the, the age thing first. I mean, I, I think we know 
from this field that, and from sort of substance use prevention that it's, it's almost never too early to start talking with kids about the, the dangers of, you know, underage drinking, of substance use, of, of, of substance use and misuse um, as, as sort of part of kind of overall ed education and, um, and creating open lines of, of communication. Um, I imagine Teresa can even <laughs> share more specifics than I can about that. That's not necessarily my area of expertise. But what, what I will share is um, what we know from the data. And we know that bef really before the age of 18, at least from the latest crop of data that came out around um, SAMHSA from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, as well as other surveillance reports from CDC, we know that before 18, prescription opioids isn't really that big of an issue. Even 18, 19, 20, that's still not, I mean, there are, there are other substances, alcohol, marijuana, um, Adderall, right? Th those substances are more pervasive and, and, uh, used, and mis used and misused in, at far greater rates than prescription opioids. As we start to get into the kind of mid-20s, the 22, 23, 24, 25, that's when we're really seeing rates uptick. Now, the counter to that, though, is that we are seeing the highest rates, the highest increases in the rates of opioid overdose deaths among that 18 to 25 year old range. So while not many individuals are encountering um, prescription opioids, we, that because they are the age that they are and have the brains that they do, they are overdosing at, at, at higher rates and at greater, in greater numbers than others. So I just want to kind of share that as context. And in terms of reaching those individuals, I think something that's critical in any work that anyone does to try and reach young people is to literally ask young people and to ask representatives from your target audience what motivates them, what they think, feel, desire from a particular issue, how they like to receive information. This can sound daunting and cumbersome. It can be a multi-million dollar research effort. It could be a very, very small and limited um, conversation that we have with people who represent our end users. And I think that's really the, the best way to sort of figure out what it is that's going to make any particular audience segment tick and click in with, it with a particular message. That being said, um, NIDA has um, Drug Facts Week, which is um, in January, so NIDA is a good resource for, I, I believe they have information for youth and young people. Um, I'd also encourage uh, folks to look at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration site. They have um, underage drinking prevention and substance use prevention resources in their SAMHSA store. Um, but what, what I've learned in the research is that it, it really varies based on kind of where the, where the young person is, what situation they're in, um, what demographic, what particular age range, what ethnicity in terms of kind of what it's going to take to move the needle for them. Thanks. I, th I think um, that it's also important to keep in mind as in, with any sensitive conversation that a lot of times we can find teachable moments when there's something that comes on the radio or on the television and it, it opens up an opportunity for us to have a conversation that might be age appropriate. Um, and Teresa, I wanted to see if you wanted to add anything to that, given um, one of the, the comments that I've heard is um, that's mommy's juice, referring to wine. Mm -hmm. is, is that the kind yeah. of conversation we should be having? What do you think? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, that those are the things, you know, from the mouths of babes when, you, when you're around uh, children and and that's the norm for them. I mean, that's. That's, that we have to deconstruct that, and it takes a lot of time. I mean, really, um, I would go back to, for folks on the, the webinar, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, has teaching packets for teachers, for uh, counselors, for, you know, different levels of, even for parents, about how to talk to your child at, at a certain age. So it's a developmental in nature. Um, you know, I think that scary for kids to hear that your mommy is sick. Um, it's horrible to hear um, from another grown-up or somebody else that your mom loves her drug more than she loves you. I mean, that causes irreparable damage. Um, and if you, if you talk to foster children 
um, who have grown up in the system or been in the system, um, it's almost hands down the number one thing they would tell you. If, if, you, if you could grant their wish to them, other than going home, that they wish they could have gone home was, I wish, I wish that, that people would have helped my mom. I wish that, that people would have helped my dad. And I wish that people wouldn't have said bad things about them. And so, you know, the, the, the um, I think, atmosphere around substance use disorder um, is changing, uh, thank goodness. And, and even, even to the degree that foster parents and resource parents um, in, in, in more forward-moving jurisdictions get a lot of training on how do you talk about these, these parents that you're very mad at. You know, you're mad at them because they've, you know, they've, they've done some things, they've um, neglected some things, including their children, it's hurt the kids. But then, you know, to have these resource parents, foster parents, other professionals, like stop the, the hurt and, and start the healing, and some of that is in our, is in our language about how we talk to kids. So um, th those teaching packets really help um, any of us, depending on who we are and what our level of expertise is, to talk to children at different ages about what's going on. And I would suggest that people look for that um, if that's something that you uh, would like to, to understand a little bit more about. Sure. So another question that's come up, a couple of questions have come up around uh, homelessness and opi opioid use and homelessness in high school students. Um, can I, either of you speak to that? What, is, what it was the question exactly? So what's a good approach for dealing with the intersection of homelessness and opioid use? Um, you know, I work with a few jurisdictions that uh, are in the, you know, they're in the worst Part of the country as it as it relates to the opioid use, um, uh, the opioid epidemic um, in upstate New York, and um, basically they say you know you keep them alive first, um, but but they're and and so that's imperative. Um, obviously, um, finding any way to prevent um, accidental overdose, which is no easy task given what we don't know about what's out on the street. But certainly, um, you know, if you think about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for those of you who took this in school, and you, you know, you have people need to have a, a safe place to go. They need to have food. They need to have relationships, right? And th those are at the at the at the height of the hierarchy. And so, to think that someone, um, anyone, can find recovery when they don't know where they're going to get their next meal and they don't have anywhere to lay their head at night is, um, is not very, um, it, it, I mean, we're not, we're not being honest with ourselves. And so you really have to have a concurrent, um, you have to have a concurrent plan. And, um, and this is probably one of the issues that we, um, that we don't have all, uh, a lot of answers to because of the housing epidemic in, in and of itself is really um, a challenge. But, you know, I would say for those, again, that are listening, if you're working with these youth, I mean, it has to be concurrent planning around, um, it takes a whole other meeting for that word, to be around how do we find safety and, um, and help this individual with their basic needs while, while we're supporting them in um, their effort to reduce, um, well, to stay alive. Um, but then to reduce their illicit drug use um, and, and find alternatives. So I think it just, it has to be concurrent. It has to be happening at the same time. Sure. Thanks. And so, Ann, I have a question for you. Um, there's a question about the curriculum. Has there been a study of the curriculum using a quasi-experimental or an experimental approach? We just launched the program. Um, in September, uh, meaning a first del location delivery. So we're not there quite yet, but we are uh, bringing on board uh, an academic that can do that for us. So we're not there yet. But that's why we pulled from evidence-based information um, so that it's not, we, we will be evidence-informed once we do collect that information. Awesome. Okay. And so another question, how do you determine if an adult is overusing their prescribed meds? Any tips? Oh, boy. Um, 
gosh, um, I mean, there there are a lot of ways, and hindsight is always twenty twenty. So, <laughs> but um, I mean, first and foremost, um, you're looking for you're looking for things that you uh, there there are things that are, are are just not normal about the way that that individual might behave or, or act. Um, if uh, if that individual, and there's so many examples, if that individual. Um, is dependent on that on that medication, and they're taking too much. Then they're going to run out of their prescription. They're going to be looking for ways, and they'll find ways to get their prescription filled earlier, to borrow, to steal, to do whatever they need to do to get that medication because they sure can't run out. So they're going to spend an um, inordin inordinate amount of time, maybe alone. Um, off doing things that you, they're not able to tell you what they're doing because they're seeking the drug. And they're doing that because their brain has got to have it. So it's, um, it's important to recognize when, you, when it feels like some things just aren't, um, you know, they're just not making sense or maybe that individual's behavior is somewhat erratic. And that's not always going to be something that you're going to pick up on. Um, but when they're starting to run out of their medication, they're going to have some, some sort of panic, whether it be very irritable. Um, um, you know, it, it, again, it's one of those things in hindsight, you look at it and you say, wow, um, I, I should have noticed because that wasn't normal. But th those are the things I think that, that, um, that I would look, look at first. Um, and certainly um, trying to just engage with them in discussion about what's going on with you know, what's the reason they're taking the medication? How how is it doing? You know, if they had a surgery, you know, how is the pain? What what's the doctor been saying? If you're trying to engage in that conversation with somebody and they're they're just not willing to engage back and they're really short with you and even irritable, you you probably have you may have some cause for concern, and I think it warrants just further um, question asking. If you ask adolescents where uh, they get the majority of their prescription pills. Um, it's, in, it's in our bathroom. Um, if a kid comes over to hang out with your kid and they ask to use the restroom, um, you have kids telling you, I go through all the cabinets. I go through everything. Um, and that's how, that's how they do it. Adults do the same thing, by the way. So I think it's, those are the, some of the things to look for. And I'm, and I'm sure there's many, many more that others could think of. So it sounds like we need to be proactive in thinking, you know, if we know that a family member is on a particular medication, we need to be proactive instead of wait until we start to see warning signs. Absolutely. So here's another question, and I'm going to spell this out because I don't know exactly what it stands for. It's an acronym, which is something I don't do well, but it's for Teresa. Our C-O-A-M-F-T-E accredited doctoral programs eligible to apply. Um, I'm not sure I know what that is either, and um, I don't apply for, uh, I'm not sure what, what it references in terms of applying. Okay. Sorry, I might need more information on that one. So, no worries, then. If whoever submitted that question, if they would like to provide some additional information, we can respond to them offline. We are, we are at our time, and so to be respectful of everyone, we do have a few questions left, and we'll share them with our presenters and, and provide responses. Um, with that, I will turn it back over to Jackie for some housekeeping. And thank you all very, very much for participating and for all of the wonderful questions. Great. Thank you so much, Robin, and thanks um, to our speakers for your expertise and willingness to share with us today and for the audience for joining and for your questions. As the webinar concludes, there will be a brief survey that pops up on your screen. Uh, please remember to provide your feedback using the survey. Um, as it helps us with future planning. Uh, once you complete the survey, you'll be able to access your certificate of completion for attending the webinar today. The survey link will also be sent out via email following the webinar. If you have any additional questions, you can send them to info at healthymarriageandfamilies.org and check out more of our resources and information at our website, which is www.healthymarriageandfamilies.org. Thank you all for joining us today. This concludes